about self-esteem, about, uh, I call it human dignity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it's a Bible story, I just tell the story. I don't make stories, I mean, I, I don't uh, invent them. I tell the story and do it in such a way that the person who is thought of as the chief character embodies the principles that I am preaching about and the, well, again, I'll give you a story real quick. <laughs> uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus didn't say, be thou a Good Samaritan. He didn't give them any abstract words like that. He showed them a picture of a person and the person told in such a way that the hearer identifies and it is the identification with a compassionate person that makes them respond to the Holy Spirit and become more compassionate in, as a result. Before I, what time is it so much? 11 Okay. Um, 11 yeah, I want to, because we, we are almost done with the, with the conversation part okay. and then we're going to eat together. Are there any other questions around the room before I ask my last couple of questions? Did you write? Did you write it down? No. No, I sent up one already, but you said, "Is there any additional ones?" I did, but you could write another one. Go ahead. What? What's the question? Well, now when you free associate, where do you go? Now when you free associate, where does your mind go? I don't do a lot of free. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they say an empty mind is a devil workshop. And also, the Lord can use an empty mind, too. But I, stay, I spend too much time worrying about things, I guess. But I don't have any whole lot of free association where my mind just flows. There's so many pressures. <laughs> when I was getting all that free association, I had not a care in the world. <laughs> so my mind was wide open. Okay. Thank That's you. a good question, though. Thank you. It's going to make me think about where my mind goes. Um, yeah. When I mean, I'm not going to ask you where you go. No. You can ask me. I'm going to ask you. So what, this is a great question, what books do you think preachers should be reading? What do you think preachers should be reading? Well, I think preachers should be reading a variety of books. Not any one kind. Right. Uh, I read, I'm just, I guess that's why I write it. Uh, I, I read history. I like Revolutionary War and stuff like that. But uh, that's just one kind of, uh, some people read romances and stuff like that. That's not, <laughs> I, I like to read solid stuff. You, know. you live in romance. You don't have to read it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but, I, but I do take very seriously, uh, I actually had this conversation uh, with another scholar last night about the fact that a lot of preachers have not fired their imagination. Mm -hmm. Like they haven't read enough that helps even their language, you know, um, the, um, the kinds of, of uh, poetry or um, autobiography, the kinds of things that will make you think about the world that you live in across cultural, reading something that somebody wrote, you know, it may be in English, but they wrote it in China, they wrote it in South America. I like <coughs> biography, mm -hmm. autobiography, that's different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to read issue books of when they come out, like for instance, this book, what's the girl's name? When you get to be 94, you don't remember names right now. You remember stuff from 100 years ago. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, it's books like that, and the latest in, in the areas of theology and history that I'm interested in, something comes out, I read it. Did you read the new Jim Crow? That's the one I'm talking about. I think it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't bought it yet. That's the problem. Right. Uh, I, I will read it. 
Right. So, yeah, so reading issue-based books, reading creative books, reading poetry, reading the kinds of things that fire your imagination. Yeah, well, I will have to confess that I am not, I will write a little bit of poetry, but I am not particularly drawn by poetry. Are you not? Mm. Well, I guess I'm a poet, so that's mm. why I'm not. Mm. And I listen to a lot. I listen to, thanks to YouTube, I can now listen to a lot of poetry, and I can listen to a lot of preaching, and I can listen, I listen to a lot of the TED Talks, because they then make me want to go look at some other things. All of that to make me, as a preacher, want to know what's going on in the world, what other people are thinking and talking about, but also to give me different language, to tap into how people are talking about. I think that's why I do it. So my, I think this is my last question for you, I think. Um, and if it's not, you'll forgive me for saying, in closing, right? <laughs> How do you I'm, I'm here, I, I can stay long as you can. I, I can. <laughs> we want, but you know, we, we do have some limits. Um, how do you want to be remembered? Mm. Just want to be remembered. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. I think there's too many different people with whom I had too many different relationships to be thought of as any one um, person. When I was in my 40s and 30s, I was a rare and turn in conventions when they had big conventions. I mean, I actually got in a, I didn't get in, a man hit at me and I knocked him down, but it wasn't because I was fighting him, he was coming after me because I told him we could get another president <laughs> And uh, But uh, now what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, 
I think your children would agree with us that they've had to share you with thousands of people. That I, I've never been at a convention where you weren't, that people weren't somehow wanting to touch you and tell you how important you are to them as a father in the gospel, as a father in the traditions, as a father in the academy. And I, I think of you, I say about you that you're Papa Mitchell. Because to me, Baba, my Papa, which is that sort of African, says even more deeply, Father. Um, and, and you have been that, not just to me, but to hundreds of people. Your legacy is long, deep, and wide. Wow. Can I make one statement that I <laughs> would have made if somebody had asked? But, because I came here assuming that we'd be talking a lot about homily principles and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest single idea that needs to be changed with most studious preachers mm -hmm. is, well, I had this doctoral study group and I would say, well, you guys, when are you going to start writing? You know, I got one more book to read. I said, I didn't, you're not getting a degree for reading. You're getting a degree for telling me something I didn't know. Hmm. People need to avoid being scholarly preachers if by that they mean I want them to know that I have read 4,500 a sermon ought to be not an idea, but an experience. The human soul does not respond to theological or other abstractions. It responds to experiential encounters, and you have to tell a story or do something that gives them a vicarious experience, and that is how the Holy Spirit yes. makes differences, causes us to change for the better. Jesus happens to be my best example. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three said that Jesus always preached his parable which is another way of saying that Jesus always told stories, and stories are what make it. Somebody, well, you just love to tell stories. If you tell stories that have specific impact, what you hope will happen, this is why you're preaching it, then it becomes a work of art rather than a, an essay. Hmm. So when I taught advanced preaching, I, one of the first statements I said was, you all have got to learn how to tell a good story. You, I got that from you. That's all I'm telling you. That's a part <laughs> of your legacy. 